Yeah, great. <laughs> we have launched this. Dobro, dobar dan svima koji ste tu trenutno. Nadam se da će biti još ljudi koji će se prijaviti. Mi danas imamo zaista čast i zadovoljstvo da je sa nama profesor Tomaš. Is that a good pronunciation? Tomaš Kamusel ili Kamusela sa instituta u Škotskoj. On će sa nama danas razgovarati o jednoj vrlo zanimljivoj temi koja je sigurno značajna i za nas s obzirom na cijeli kontekst bosanskog jezika i sve ono što je bosanski jezik prolazio kroz svoju historiju od svojih početaka pa do danas. Naravno, profesor neće danas govoriti o bosanskom jeziku, ali će predstaviti jedan širi kontekst u kojem je vrlo značajno i zanimljivo razumjeti odnos između historije, između politike i političkih procesa i načina na koji se to sve manifestira u jednom jeziku ili jeziku. Među jezicima, ja ću na početku ovoga izlaganja predstaviti profesora. To će biti samo neki kratki uvod da biste mogli pratiti. A onda će nam profesor predstaviti svoju temu koja nosi naslov Counting the World's Languages, the Politics and Discontents of Enumeration. Tako da će to biti tema o kojoj će profesor danas govoriti. Nakon što profesor završi sa svojim izlaganjem, mi ćemo imati priliku nekih sigurno 15, možda i 20 minuta za pitanja i odgovore. Ukoliko neko od vas bude imao pitanje koje želi postaviti, vi možete naravno to na bosanskom, a ja ću pokušati prevesti na engleski kako bi profesor mogao odgovoriti. Još jednom vam se zahvaljujem svima koji ste danas ovdje i evo možemo početi da dalje ne gubimo vrijeme. Ok, today with us we have profesor Tomas Kamusela. Is that the pronunciation? Ok, great. He is an interdisciplinary historian of modern Central and Eastern Europe with a focus on language politics and nationalism. In 2001, he received a PhD in political science from the Institute of Western Affairs in Poznan, Poland. A decade later, in 2011, he obtained a habilitation in cultural studies from University of Social Science and Humanities, also Poland. Between 1995 and 2007, the professor worked at Opal University, Poland, and afterward in Trinity College, Dublin, and Krakow University of Economics before joining the uh, University of St. Andrews in 2011, and university uh, second consecutive year top rated, am I right, in UK? Yeah, that's great to know. Uh, meanwhile, he did research as a, as a postdoctoral fellow in the European University Institute in Florence, the Kluck Center for Scholars in the Library of Congress, the Institute for Human Science in Vienna, the Herder Institute in Marburg, and the Slavic Eurasian Research Center in Sapporo, Japan. He published several books and uh, papers, and I'm going to mention just these two books, Words in Space and Time, that's the recent one, yeah and politics and the Slavic languages. I think that one will, will be very interesting, interesting for us today. Thank you very much. We are very grateful to have you here today to, with us and very happy. And I hope we will enjoy in this topic you are going to present today one more time, counting the world's languages, the politics and this contents of enumeration. You can. Hvala Institutu za jezike na pozivu da održimo današnje predavanje. Hvala organizatorom Elmiri Rešić i Jasminu Hođiću. And uh, it, is very, it is a great pleasure that I can be with you today uh, in this series of lectures organized by the Language Institute. Uh, and as part of the series, uh, uh, although not uh, in, uh, on the spot in Sarajevo, but thanks to technology, now we can kind of develop uh, the range of uh, speakers uh, and audiences and talks which we uh, can give. So uh, coming straight to my today's talk, it is about uh, counting the languages. Uh, it is uh, quite a recent uh, phenomenon that actually people uh, see languages as discrete entities. I have my students and probably you too uh, in Sarajevo who ask, who ask me, how many languages do, do you know? Yeah. 
And as uh, people who deal in different languages, different writing systems, uh, they know the answer is not straightforward. Yeah, because uh, let's put it like this: uh, having been born in Poland, in southern Poland, uh, where there is this uh, uh, country's largest nowadays minority of Silesians, my first language is Silesian. Yeah, something between Czech and Polish, if uh, if you want. Yeah, and German. Yeah? So I was obviously. Uh, educated in a Polish medium school, so I'm fully literate in Polish. My first language was Silesian, but until today it has not been used at school, so I can use it at the level of a kid, yeah? because uh, I left this uh, uh, community of Silesian speakers, but it is my L1, uh, yeah. so-called mother tongue. Mother. So is it one language or two languages, Polish and Silesian now? And uh, when it comes to Slavic languages, I can read in most of them. I can talk relatively fluently in, uh, apart from Polish, uh, in Czech, to a degree in Russian. And let's say because Silesian is close to Slovak, I understand Slovak. And when I go, for instance, to Bosnia, uh, I speak Slovak and people kind of understand, you know, it's not full understanding, uh, but kind of understand. So how many languages do I know? And obviously, in my youth, there was the Serbo-Croatian language, so it was one, and now there is uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Montenegrin, and Serbian, and even Bunjevac, yeah. So as you can see, there is no obvious answer how many languages are and how many languages a person knows because languages are negotiable and they are not discrete. You cannot say uh, that uh, language X uh, begins here and stop, stops there. And languages which is often not uh, very well understood are not creations of the nature they are created maintained developed and construed about as discrete entities by people yeah. so it is part and parcel of politics to a larger degree or lesser degree. In some areas, the politicization of languages is higher, in some areas is smaller. For instance, in Central Europe, language is basically politics, yeah? because in Central Europe, people are socialized uh, during the modern period, uh, the age of nationalists, you could say the past two centuries, that speakers of language X equates nation X, and wherever speakers of language X live, a nation state for the nation X should be created. Yeah. That's the normative belief, which is very recent and which is kind of delimited to Central Europe where people believe in that. Central Europe, broadly speaking, from Scandinavia to the Balkans and from Italy, Germany, uh, to Ukraine, Belarus, uh, and the Baltic states. Another cluster of ethno-linguistic nation states uh, of this type where people have this normative belief is in Southeast Asia, but I won't be going uh, into it. When uh, the uh, belief, idea arose that we can count languages, uh, it arose mostly in Europe. Uh, to my knowledge, although I was looking for such information, there was no there, there was no such an 
exercise project, uh, a scholarly pro project of this type that uh, would develop in the Islamic area uh, from Northern Africa to Southeast Asia or in the area of uh, the Chinese uh, uh, cultural uh, pre predominant. So it is also telling that it is a very modern thing. And uh, before you can start counting some objects, some entities, you must construe them as units which are separate from one another, which are self-contained and which are counter, which is a very counterintuitive thing from the global perspective of saying it, because languages are very uncounted, very continuous, yeah. And in English, uh, and also in Bosnian, yeah, uh, the very terms which we are using for describing language and languages are counterintuitive and they are pushing us into this area to see languages as uncountable. Why? Basically, the use of the term language for the biological capacity, evolutionary capacity for speech, and uh, the use of the term language for separate languages is confusing us because these are two different things. And it is the same in Bosnian. Yeah? You have Jezik for the capacity for speech and also Jezik for the actualization of this capacity for speech in the form of German, French, Bosnian, Montenegrin, you name it. Yeah. So we as linguists, and we as uh, uh, social scientists must make a clear distinction, uh, must maintain a clear distinction in our head between this biological capacity, evolutionary capacity for speech, which is biological and which is, uh, uh, which is a product of nature. Yeah? We don't have control over it. Yeah? We are born... Uh, uh, with this capacity uh, uh, hardwired, if, if, you, if, you, if, if you may, if I may, into our bodies. Yeah? Yeah. So from this perspective, there is just one language. All humans share this capacity. Yeah? Uh, and you can call it humanese if you want uh, to name it somehow. And there is just one such capacity to our knowledge because we do not know any other uh, species uh, which would have this capacity for this uh, symbolical exchanges with one and uh, with one another. Now, this capacity for speech is actualized in human communities and humanity lives in communities from the very beginning of its existence. So once again, uh, we have another very important uh, feature of this capacity for speech language uh, as a biological evolutionary development to bear in mind what was the evolutionary pressure which led to the development of this capacity, or to have a look at it from the other side, what is the primary function of language? Uh, whenever people, even linguists, uh, discuss this issue, they say, oh, the primary uh, uh, function of language is communication. Not true. The primary function of language is group bonding, uh, the creation of social cohesion within, uh, uh, within human communities and make it effective so you 
spend as little time as possible because human communities have other pressure like food yeah if yeah. you don't have food you die <laughs> so uh, ba 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 basically that was that was the evolutionary pressure which led to the development of language as far as we know as far as, as it has been uh, ascertained through research because uh, in uh, uh, among among uh, humano hu humanoid uh, 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 apes uh, like chimpanzees uh, social cohesion is ensured by uh, fair grooming and fair grooming is possible only one on one yeah so mm -hmm. two uh, individuals can groom each other at any one time which is very time consuming but this verbal grooming afforded by language allows us uh, usually to groom two to up to three people at one point. Yeah, so it's very effective, 300% more effective. So that was the pressure of uh, uh, evolutionary pressure for the development of speech, uh, of language uh, as such. Now, it's coming in uh, actualizations, which are different in different human groups, as long as these human groups, human communities, are stable and maintained uh, for a couple of uh, generations. Yeah. And uh, uh, the construing about linguistic difference among human groups came in the form of the concept of a language, that uh, there are different languages that's why um, uh, in order but but it's very difficult to express in english this difference between language which is uncountable and which does not take plural and uh, languages which take uh, plural so sometimes uh, in in my research uh, i use the german terms uh, which are plural sprache for this uh, capacity for speech uh, and uh, Einzelsprachen for these actualizations. Okay. When you have a look at sources from the Western uh, civilization, so let's say antiquity, the sources talk about two languages only. They, they, they speak uh, about Latin and Greek. Yeah. And Latin and Greek were used in writing and they used different writing systems. So the uh, Western European thinking about languages as Einzelsprachen, as separate entities, is strongly connected to writing, to different systems of writing. But there were just two languages. Mm -hmm. When uh, Christianity uh, in the fourth century became the official uh, religion of uh, uh, the Roman Empire, there were three languages. Yeah? Apart from Greek, apart from Latin, also Hebrew, all of them in different uh, scripts. But obviously, the people who lived in antiquity, they realized that, you know, you went to Gaul, today's France, you were to uh, Brit Br Brittany, today's Britain, uh, you went to Hibernia, to the, today's Ireland, and, and people were speaking differently. Mm -hmm. But they were not writing, so they didn't have languages. They had dialectos, dialectin. Different forms of speech, but not committed to writing in antiquity in Greek and in Latin were referred to as dialects or barbarian gibberish. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because barbarian is barbar. It's from uh, uh, gibberish. So until the 
early Middle Ages, there, there were three real languages. Yeah. Then there was obviously the rise of uh, the Islamic Caliphate and Arabic was another language. Yeah. And, uh, but in all these, uh, in this Christian uh, area, in this Islamic area, there was this idea there is one true language in true script and this language from the monotheistic normative perspective was the language of God and of the holy book. Yeah? Yeah. And that was the only language. The other ones were dia dialect or they were just uh, uh, um, kind of barbarian bar speech. Bar bar barbarian speech. Yeah. There was then an interesting development uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire, so-called Byzantium, because from time to time they allowed for the translation of the uh, Bible into the language, into the barbarian speech of some kind of powerful barbarians, and by uh, by the token, the speech became another language with its own script. So it was the story of the translation of the Bible into Syriac, then into Armenian, then into Georgian, then into Gothic, such a language, Germanic language, and then in, uh, in the ninth century into uh, Church Slavonic. So this idea started appearing in uh, uh, the Byzantium area that there may be more languages than one. And then actually they can proliferate as long as through political allegiance, a certain barbarian, powerful barbarian group becomes allied to the Eastern Roman emperor and the Eastern Roman emperor would kindly give uh, the, the, the permit to translate the Bible into mm -hmm. uh, the language of the barbarians. Yeah. It wasn't the case of Western Christianity or of the uh, Islamic world because translations of the Bible were not allowed or the Quran. Yeah? The Quran was always to be in the Arabic original and the Bible was always to be in the canonical Latin translation. This change in the Western world, in Western Europe, Central Europe, with the reformation in the 16th century, uh, one of the main uh, demands of the reformation was to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Mm -hmm. It also, this demand created a new phenomenon that new languages could be written in the old script of the holy language, meaning Latin, meaning the Latin alphabet, and that new scripts didn't have to be developed for these languages. languages. That was a very important development, yeah? because previously a true language had to be the language of some holy book or the translation of the holy book, and it, and in, it should be coming in its own writing system script. Yeah? Yeah in its own alphabet and so on and so on. So, uh, at, 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 uh, at uh, uh, the threshold of the modern, early modern times, let's say 16th, 17th century, there were from the uh, Western European perspective, Central European perspective, around 40 languages, in which in these languages, the Bible or some other uh, uh, accepted holy books like the Quran were coming. Yeah? Let's have a look uh, just briefly at the Arabic language area. Yeah? We say that half a, half a billion people speak uh, and write Arabic from today's Morocco to today's Iraq, from today's uh, uh, Syria uh, to today's Yemen and Eritrea. Yet, if you have a close look at the different so-called dialects of the Arabic language, they are as different as French and Italian. Yeah? Uh, but still, they are dialects of the Arabic language. language yeah? On the other hand, 
Romanian and Mol uh, Moldovan are exactly the same, but for political reasons, uh, including Russian neo-imperialists, they were different until recently. Although in uh, 2022, Moldova changed the constitution now that uh, the official language of Moldova is Romanian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before there was this kind of Russian pressure, which uh, which which required to keep Moldovan as a separate language, although they are exactly the same. So, on the other hand, what I've just mentioned shows that languages, in plural, are human constructs, are po constructs uh, which are also imposed by politics uh, uh, on people or their political choices of given human uh, communities. That was the case of Serbo-Croatian breaking up, uh, being broken up uh, into four uh, or five follow-up uh, uh, l l languages because people decided so, yeah? because it served certain needs and goals of people. Okay, so counting is a complicated business, yeah, because it is counting Counting language is a complicated business and it is kind of interactive business because it's counting the imaginings of people at a given time, in a given place, what a, what a proper language is. Yeah. So uh, you, you, that's why it's kind of difficult to count it, uh, languages, because it's like counting water. Yeah. If, if, if you agree that there is one Mediterranean Sea, it is one language. But if you say Aegean is different, it's two languages. If Tyrrhenian Sea is different, it is three languages, Sweet. and so on and so on. So we have to remember that we are counting our uh, imaginings in our head uh, when it comes to counting language. But nevertheless, there is a history of it. Yeah, uh, Basically, uh, at the turn of the 19th century, at the, uh, in the age of high imperialism, when basically all the world was divided among uh, Western European empires, or almost all of the world, uh, European imperialists had a problem. Yeah. How come that we can divide the world? What makes it right that we dominate people on the other continents? And the answer was simple. We are bringing them the word of God, the Bible. And the Bible is civilization. And mm -hmm. we know the Bible, but they don't know the Bible. So we have the right to come to them and to make them into the slaves because it is a costly business to have an empire. Mm -hmm. But we are giving them something bigger than the exploitation. Uh, they have to work for us, but we give them the salvation. They will have eternal life after death. Okay, fine. So that, that, that was the deal. Probably you don't you you smell that the deal stinks. <laughs> Very but, much. But it 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 was coming uh, with this biblical uh, or interpretation of the biblical idea of evangelization yeah. uh, that uh, the second coming of Christ will would not happen before all the people all around the world can have access to the word uh, of God oh. in their own language. Yeah. So the British and uh, foreign Bible society was founded at the beginning of the 19th century, and they went into the business of translating the Bible, or at least the New Testament, in all the colonial languages. And it was complicated, difficult. It was before computers because it's required uh, uh, saying that people speaking something, uh, they speak a language and uh, deciding where a language ends, one language ends and another starts. begins, uh, starts. So uh, by, by, by the end of the 19th century or the long 19th century, you could say the Sijura could be the outbreak of the First World War. There were around 700 uh, translated, the, the, the New Testament, the Bible and the New Testament were translated into around 700 languages. But uh, 
already at that time, anthropolog anthropologists were saying that in the world there are around uh, 1,000, 2,000 languages. So it, it, it was like uh, the biblical societies uh, involved in the business of translating uh, the, 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 uh, the Holy Scripture, so-called, were in the business of catching up with anthropolo uh, anthropological uh, findings. And this catching up continues to this day. Mm -hmm. And a uh, big part and parcel of this catching up uh, was this uh, Protestant organization, the so-called uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, established in 1934 in, uh, in Texas. I will return to it in a moment, but the main pro product of this institute, apart from translations of the Bible, was also a reflection on the number of languages into which the Bible had to be translated, uh, because this was, that would be the benchmark uh, for what they were doing. And in the 1970s, this benchmark became the reference ethnologue, probably about which you've heard, which is nowadays the most widely used reference book on the on establishing the number of the world's languages and where they are being spoken and by how many people. But, uh, but before we go into the ethnologue, let's return to the Second World War, which brought about, uh, on the one hand, the domination of English because uh, the Second World War was won by uh, Britain and the United States, the English-speaking countries. And it also brought about the colonization. The empires of Portugal, France, Britain, you name it, disappeared, obviously with the exception of the Russian Empire, which has not been decolonized to this day. And the colonization brought about production of information, books, newspapers, documents in a plethora of other languages, so-called new. They, they were not new, obviously. Yeah. They were just allowed to be used for administration, education, and other mm -hmm. uh, reasons. And uh, in the 1960s, information in the form of books and newspapers was regularly produced in around 600 languages. And uh, the only institution in the world which had the as uh, aspiration to collect all the information in all these languages was the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress came to such a point that they decided it was impossible for a person like a librarian, even a group of librarians, a managed group of librarians, to sort this information manually. Mm -hmm. So they decided the information must be retrievable mechanically. Nowadays, we, we, which we would say through computers. And they came up with this idea of mark, uh, machine re readable, uh, cata cataloging codes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was the beginning of non-denominational, non-religious counting of lang languages. Because what they established: oh, these books, these newspapers are coming in language X. Give this language X a code, so we know that uh, when we come to the shelf with this. Uh, uh, wow. with these books, uh, with these codes, they are in this language and we need to to get a specialist in the uh, uh, Balkan reading room or the Southeastern reading room uh, to be able to read it and deal with it yeah. further on. So they developed around 200 codes and that was completely sufficient and they did it in conjunction with the United Nations, because the United Nations was also dealing with this mass of information. And it was sufficient until the end of communism. The end of communism brought about the breakup of the Soviet Union, also breakup of Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, and more decolonization and, uh, uh, with that, and uh, the use of more of language. Also, the end of communism uh, overlapped with the rise of the internet. And on the internet, people 
could start using languages which were not accepted by a state in which they lived because initially the internet was not controlled by any state. Mm -hmm. So it brought about an explosion, a mm -hmm. further explosion in the production of uh, information in other languages. Initially, cyberspace was almost wholly in English, but gradually, especially at the beginning of the 21st century, all the other lang languages began to be uh, used over the internet. And the internet had a problem because first only in the Latin script you could write on the internet, yeah. but it was not, uh, not viable. So they developed these systems uh, for the use of other scripts, uh, the so-called universal character uh, um, chart, yeah, a character <laughs> chart, which by now covers around uh, 200 scripts and in total around 130,000 uh, letters, 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 130,000 letters, you could say, or, or uh, graphemes, if you want uh, a term. And out of sudden, the Library of Congress they decided because the government, you know, it was this uh, time of neo neoliberal economics, you are not getting any more money. So the Library of Congress said, okay, we cannot deal with it uh, yeah. if we do not employ more librarians. So yeah. in uh, around 2005, 2007, they developed a new standard for counting the languages of the entire world, the so-called ISO 639, dash three, uh, and they were kind of uh, uh, thinking that this standard would be capacious enough for 10,000 languages, which would be the absolute total, according to them. And, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't run this standard, so they outsourced this standard to this uh, uh, instit uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics, mm -hmm. but the Summer, uh, uh, Institute of Linguistics, uh, they just are using for the purpose of running this uh, uh, standard of counting and uh, coding languages, uh, they use the acronym SIL, S-I-L, mm -hmm. because, you know, the, in the world you have many, many religions and it should not, yeah. they should not be obviously religion, but they are, and that's a problem, <laughs> I would say, with this, uh, uh, standard uh, of counting and coding languages. Uh, there were other standards developed, but they like like developed by Lingua Sphere in the in the early 2010s uh, to cover 30,000 languages with all uh, varieties. But they was too capacious and not needed. It was too ambitious, you could say. Uh, so the internet. Uh, which is a kind of decentralized institution run by people uh, who are interested in running a different sector, a different segment of uh, internet, which underpins a standard uh, the whole business, because the internet basically is a reflection of the world in which we live. So when people believe there are many languages, there are many languages on the inter internet. If you believe the world is divided into nations and into states, so nation and state are reflected in, in, in the internet. Right, yeah. There are uh, different standards for uh, names of countries, territories of countries, and these standards were gradually adopted uh, on the internet, and the standard which underpins uh, the recognition of languages as separate entities in cyberspace on the internet is the standard developed by the Library of Congress and outsourced to SIL uh, ISO 639-3. So that's the explanation of these languages and how many we have uh, of these languages uh, on the internet. Potentially, uh, this uh, ISO standard covers 8,000 languages thus far, so potentially there are 8,000 languages. But as you can see, 
probably uh, not 8,000 languages are used on the internet in any regular fashion. When it comes to the re regular fashion, you have to have a look at other indicators showing you how it is done. So you can uh, have a look at the translations of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights, which right. is the, the most important document of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, there were around 200 translations. 200 languages, 200 translations. Codes as developed uh, by the Library of Congress. Nowadays, there are 600 yeah, translations. But once again, we know it is not 600 languages which are being used. Yes. You cannot call uh, regularly for book production, newspaper production, information production. You can have a look at Wikipedias. There are Wikipedias in around 320 languages. Yes. Yeah. So it is another, uh, another indicator. Then you can turn to actually the business of book publishing in which languages, in how many languages books are published for business purposes. So meaning publishing a novel, which is bought by readers, and then uh, profit is generated for the publisher and for the author. For this purpose, there are around 70 languages. Yeah. Uh, but in reality, this business of book publishing is profitable in not more than 50 languages. Uh, so uh, it's another indicator. And yeah. here, when we look at this indicator, there is also this inequality, stark in inequality, which shows up in the world. Because all these 50 languages are languages from Eurasia. All the other continents, the Americas, uh, Africa, uh, Australia, they are using European languages for oh, yeah. book publishing and for uh, education. Mm -hmm. And then when you look, have a look at these 50 languages, uh, three quarters of them are from Europe. And exactly. all and from from uh, from from Asia, so uh, this exercise of analyzing what we are counting when we are counting languages, the history of this exercise, uh, what was informing this exercise, uh, and what are the effects of this exercise today, they also allow us. Uh, uh, to construe about the world and to analyze the world as a very unequal place. So probably I stop here. If you mm -hmm. have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank yeah, you. Uh, I believe someone will have uh, questions. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting for me, insightful, definitely. Uh, I will first ask if someone from, if someone uh, of the participants have questions. And if they don't, maybe I have two or three questions that I would like to, to ask. But first, does anyone has anything to ask? Professor. I'm sure Professor will be glad to answer the questions. Yeah, maybe you can ask question in Bosnian and I'm gonna translate if you have anything that was left unanswered. Anyone? Uh, Yasmin sent something. Uh, let me see. Do you do you see the question? The, the yeah, text. I'm, 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 I'm going to read it. Oh, 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 Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. I particularly appreciated the narrative on the initial or main languages of the world and the beginning of discussion on the number of languages in the world. I would like to add that despite the existence of living narratives in religion circles about a single initial language on earth, it's worth noting that the Bible and the Quran share a common view regarding the existence of multiple languages in the world. In the book of Genesis 10, 5 in the Bible, it states from these, the maritime people spread out into their ter territories by their clans within their nation, each with 
with its own language. Additionally, in the Quran, it is stated, and of his sign in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Indeed, is that indeed in that are signs of those those of knowledge. With your permission, I would like to add some thoughts on the relationship between Serbo Croatian and other Slavic languages. And I don't see that's that's ending here. Yeah, personally, I am, and that's the end. Yasmin, okay. we hope that you will continue <laughs> with the with the question with the question or one what, what you wanted to say. Maybe yeah, you have I, some I, comment on this. Yeah, I, I can jump on that. Yeah, it is in the Bible. Yeah, uh, but obviously, if we talk about the Bible and the Quran as scholars, not as the faithful, they are creation of people. Of the time of the or from the Middle East with certain normative ideas which they had, and obviously, people at the time they were aware of multiplicity of what we nowadays call languages. Obviously, these are translations, yeah. So we would have yeah. to go to the Hebrew original, Arabic original, and see how they were referring to what we nowadays refer as languages to try to uncover what was the original. Yes, under that term. Yet, yet. In the Bible, and correct me if I'm wrong, also in the Quran or in in the in the hadiths around Quran, there is the story of the of the Tower of Babel, yeah? that there was one language at the beginning, like one yeah. God. So the, the, there is this kind of normative monotheism, uh, which which is coupled with normative mono uh, monolingualism, that there is only one true language, and the God kind of destroyed this one language so that the people should be humble and they should not be challenging God by building uh, a, a tower which would be reaching the sky yeah because okay. the people should know should know uh, the, 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 the the place yeah so it's, it's, uh, like in the Roman Empire uh, which uh, in the pre-christian times people were aware of the multiplicity of languages but they were equating languages with writing and there were just two languages which were written. Uh, for administrative literary purposes, Latin and Greek. Uh, uh, you know, when I was trying to find out... We hear something from you, Yasmin. Okay, uh, so I will continue. Is it a question? Um, I don't hear very well. Yasmin, do you no. have the question or you are just speaking to somebody? Probably speaking. Yeah, he forgot to mute. Okay, so, so, so let me continue. When I was trying to find out if there were ever projects of counting languages in yeah. other areas of the world, like this Chinese area, mm -hmm. I was discussing with, with my colleagues from Japan uh, and so on. And it turns out that from the Chinese perspective, there was just one language, Chinese. Yeah. Why? Because everything which was written in the Chinese script was seen as Chinese, even though we know that the Chinese script in the early modern times was used for writing Japanese, Korean, yeah. uh, or Vietnamese, which are as different from Chinese as Hungarian from, from German. German. Yeah, yeah, exactly. German. So, yeah, yeah. So, so you see, people have a certain concept what a proper language is. And this concept can be uh, civilizational. It can be underpinned by religion. It's by kind of... politics, by context, context yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had one question or maybe just um, like a comment before uh, Yasmin ends with his question or adds what he wanted to say. Uh, when you talk about servo creation, like a construct and a follow-up languages. I wonder uh, when we when we think about Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin language, we can uh, follow their continuum historical from the origin, and we take that uh, old church Slavonic is the origin from which they developed. But in those early times, we had something that we call reductions like different types of writing and scripts and everything else and uh, beliefs that were reflected in writing, in script, 
and in usage of uh, altered Slavonic language. And from that time, we can uh, talk about different like uh, different lines of the de development of Bosnian language, of Croatian, of Serbian, of Montenegrin, especially Bosnian, uh, Croatian, and Serbian. We have those different reductions of old church Slavonic languages that were later like forcefully united under the Serbo-Croatian language. And after that, they like um, started to living their own life on their own. But they uh, they weren't a follow up languages developed from Serbo Croatian. They existed long before that language was constructed, and they just uh, started their new life again after the dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia. How would you comment on that? Because they had their writing systems, and they had that oral um, tradition that was used, and that was reflected in the scripts, in the found scripts. So you can answer this question as a scholar or as a politician. I try yeah. to answer this question uh, as a scholar. First of all, let's try uh, to get certain nor to get to to make to make visible certain normative beliefs which you've had in your talk. Language continues its life. Languages do not live. They do not die, they do not have sex, they are not like humans. Yeah. yeah. They, they, are, they are rather like tables and houses which we as humans develop, maintain, change, destroy, replace. So where do we have this normative belief that languages live? It was August Schleicher in uh, the 1860s in emulation of he was he was a Prussian linguist in emulation of the theory of evolution as developed in the 1850s, 10 years before by Darwin, he was saying that languages are living organisms, yeah, uh, which is obviously not true, yeah? yeah. And he also developed this theory of the genetical development of languages, yeah, that languages have certain past, which goes back forever and which goes into the future, or languages are parent languages and are children. Languages. So you, you have these trees developed, which you see very often at schools. And it was a great bonus for uh, ethnolinguistic nationalisms uh, nationalists in the 19th century because oh it, the language is mine the language is mine and let's say these language used uh, in the balkans the slavic language used in the balkans in certain area in the 8th century uh, is not old bulgarian it is old slovenian it is not old slovenian it is old bosnian it is not old bosnian it is old serbian and so on and so on. Yeah. okay I will leave for a moment the uh, question of Serbo-Croatian language because I know it's sensitive, yeah, and I don't want to walk into this minefield now. But I can, <laughs> I, I can, I can turn probably to another example. <clears throat> let's let's turn our gaze to what today is Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. In uh, uh, the early 10th century, it was uh, Rush, such a country, yeah? Yeah. extending from the Baltic Sea to, uh, to uh, uh, the Black Sea. <laughs> there was the Mongol invasion of Europe, the country was broken up, and most of the territories, and the territories were divided between the Mongol Empire, so-called Golden Horde, and, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And the official language of, of Rus was uh, Church Slavonic, which was this language of South Slavic provenance developed uh, by, uh, by, by, by the monks who translated the parts of the New Testament in the ninth century into this language. Yeah? And these monks were from the region of Salonika. 
fine. Uh, Cyr I, I mean Cyril and Methodius, yeah, fine. Yet, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania was ruled by not Christians, by people who had their own religion, today's Lithuanians. And they were not interested in the whole Christian business and in this language they, they couldn't understand. But in this area, the, in, the, in the state, majority of people were speaking Slavic. Uh, what probably the, the, you, what today you could identify as, as Belarusian uh, and, and, and Ukrainian. And they started using the Cyrillic alphabet for writing the local language, which made it into the earliest Slavic language uh, used by speakers, not of some old translation. Uh, and it was called Ruthenian. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this Ruthenian language was used officially in this area until the beginning of the 19th century. I'm not going into this business. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, such languages as Belarusian were developed as standard languages and Ukrainian. And uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian linguistic nationalists are saying that, that uh, Ruthenian was old Belarusian and old Ukrainian. And now we have also uh, Russian neo-imperialists, and uh, in uh, in the in the Russian neo-imperialist view, uh, Ukrainian and Belarusian are rural dialects of the oh. Great Russian language, yeah. and only Great Russian language exists. And Ruthenian was Old Russian. Yeah. So, so you see, people for today's needs, reinterpret the past in the way that suits them. Suits them, even though their reinterpretations do not make sense from the historical perspective. Yeah, yeah, I can agree on that, that we all have like our perception of historical processes and languages and everything that's related to them. But I also uh, think that we uh, should not ignore the facts about some specificities of a language. And uh, if a language has a long tradition that is like unique in some sense, that then we have to speak about that language as a specific language that differentiates itself from another one, no matter of the perception who wants to admit that or not. I completely agree. Yeah. There is this Latin tag, ad fontes, stick to the sources. Yeah. Exactly. So I, so I stick to the sources, and now I'm writing a book about uh, the bans on the official use of the Serbian language in Serbia between 1832 and uh, uh, 1868 tributary Serbia, Ottoman Serbia, the official language in this country was Slaveno-Serbian. So yeah. you could say a, a, a mixture of, of Church Russian Slavonic and... or of Church Slavonic rather. Yeah. And if you want a Russian, probably Ruthenian, probably Ukrainian. Yeah, exactly. that's another complication. And, and uh, vernacular Serbian written in the Church Slavonic style of orthography as used until today in Russian, Belarusian, or uh, Ukrainian. Oh, uh, sorry, but... sorry, we are on the end of this meeting, so I have to stop you here. Thank you very much for everything. I hope we will have another opportunity to, to meet with you in person or via Zoom or any other way and to, to continue with this conversation. It was very great to hear from you. Thank you very much. And my talk obviously is underpinned by my article, which I submitted with your yeah. journal. So you may have- Yeah, it's gonna be published so we can, yeah, we can read it and learn some more things. Thank you very much and You're enjoy welcome. your Thank day. Thank you very much for having me. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, see you. <laughs> Poslovi, ja stavim ih na grupu. Sekund.